I'm hoping everybody caught our episode a few weeks back, maybe it's been a couple months now, on ObjectNet. For those of you who need a quick refresher, ObjectNet is sort of a sidecar project to the ever-popular ImageNet corpus of images. So as most of you know, a lot of the computer vision challenges or benchmarks or just uh, general training data sets you use, ImageNet comes up over and over again. I think over a thousand different class labels, everything from truck to dog to cat to panda, don't forget the gibbons. And the titles of these papers just in the past couple years started including the phrase meets or often beats human level accuracy. Well, that's as, pretty much as good as it gets. If it's going to do object recognition as well as a person, I don't know that I can hold the algorithm to much high of a standard. So where do we go next? Well, before there's a next, there might need to be a step backwards here. Because the problem is, many of those algorithms do not generalize to training data not including in the ImageNet corpus. ObjectNet is a corpus of out-of-sample test examples to see how well your computer vision algorithm generalizes. And let me tell you guys, the report cards are not pretty. These 99-point-whatever accurate models are not generalizing very well. Well, why not? Could some of it be due to overfitting? It almost implicitly sounds like this is an issue of overfitting. And sure, models do overfit, but at some level you kind of expect that. Imagine if I showed you a page of logos from some graphic design student's project, specifically logos placed into actual scene settings. There's no doubt in my mind you could identify what the logos are. Now, if one of those images also had the Nike logo in it, you would certainly recognize that one too, but you'd recognize it as the Nike logo. Is that overfitting? Not really in the strictest sense, but that line is worth exploring. So after finishing my prep work for the ObjectNet interview, I thought, you know what? I need to look around and see what the hacker community is doing. Is anybody trying to break models or just come at them from more of a lower level, what the heck does this thing do? And I was fortunate enough to come across a blog post that gave me just what I was looking for. <laughs> This week on the show, I'm joined by Julia Evans, blogger, technologist, programmer, zine publisher, and presenter of some pretty awesome YouTube talks. We've got that and more right after the break. Hey, Data Skeptic listeners, we're launching another survey, and we'd like your help. If you've got two minutes to spare, please take our survey at dataskeptic.com slash survey. Your feedback helps us deliver the quality content you can find from Data Skeptic, and you might just win a free t-shirt. So do me a favor and head over to dataskeptic.com slash survey and tell us about yourself. I'm Julia, and I run a little zine publishing company called Wizard Zines. Awesome. Well, tell me a little bit about Wizard Zines before we get into our main topic. So I think five years ago, I was working as a developer, and I was really excited about S-Trace, which is a tool that lets you trace system calls. And I was giving a talk about it, and I wrote a zine about it, which is like a little like 20-page like hand-drawn thing in Sharpie about like my love for S-Trace. And I gave it out at this conference. Anyway, long story short, it's a whole thing. But people really loved it, and I started making more. And now I run a business doing that for the last like eight months, and it's turned into this big thing. That's how I spend a lot of my time right now. Very cool. Well, I know a lot of the audience will know what grep is, but not necessarily S-Trace. Can you give us the high <laughs> level and share the love? Sure. So let's say you have a program and your program is, for example, opening files on Linux and you want to know like which files it's opening, right? S-Trace is, is this tool that will tell you every system call the program is running. So a system call is basically like the way that your program has to open every file. It'll ask the operating system like, hey, can you open this file? And there's no other way to open a file on Linux except to use a system call. So if you use S-Trace, you can kind of see exactly what your program is doing. You don't have to have the source code and you don't have to know even the programming language that it's written in. I think of it as like this magical spy tool <laughs> that you can use to learn about what any program is doing. I love it because of that. Very neat. Yeah. I'll have some links to things about your zines in the show notes, including that one for people who want to check it out. I also have had the pleasure of seeing a number of conference talks you've given on YouTube and heard you on other podcasts and read your blog. And there was one blog post in particular I wanted to invite you on to discuss because it matched so well with the interpretability theme we're covering today. So I guess we'll get into the nitty gritty of that. To start off with, maybe I could ask, what was your background with neural networks and deep learning before you went on to the adventure we're going to talk about today? Yeah, at the time I was working as a machine learning engineer, building sort of fraud models, but I had never used a neural network ever. 
basically. And I had like no idea about how they worked. And the reason I wrote this post, because this is really about a paper that I read and that I loved. And the reason I love this paper is that it started to give me kind of like the first idea about how neural networks work, right? Instead of being like, this is a total black box and it's magic. In terms of like, you'd done some, I would guess, XGBoost kind of stuff, or what types of algorithms did you know before? Like random forests and logistic regression. I assume had a lot of the knowledge carries over. Did you have any presumptions or surprises that you learned along the way about how deep learning works? Well, this paper is about how to trick neural networks. And the really surprising thing to me about the paper was that it basically shows in a way that neural networks are more like a linear function than you might think in some ways, which was not something that I would have assumed. Like, I think I I knew that there were sort of like logistic functions in there, but like the idea that it would act like at a large scale in any way like a linear function was very surprising to me. This neural network is like ImageNet, right? That's classifying images. And I was like, well, that's not a linear function at all, but actually like it is like a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, I think everyone's had that moment where you first tried the legitimate image search, whether it's Google or somebody else's, where you're like, oh, wow, a lot has happened in the last decade. This works now. You know, we have to give a lot of credit to image recognition, but creeping up on us is, of course, these ways you can trick it. Was it reading that paper your first introduction to it, or did you tend to notice that that was sort of a part of the discussion just learning about neural networks. I think reading that paper was my first introduction to that idea that you could trick a neural network. Yeah, I'd never heard of it before. So one thing I liked about your blog post was it got really deep into the hands-on of things. We've covered these fooling image papers in the past and sort of talked about like, okay, the gradient does this and that. But yours was the first like really hands-on step-by-step walkthrough. Could you talk through that experience and the steps you took to do your own fooling of a neural network? Yeah, totally. So I read this paper and I was like, that's cool. But I don't personally believe in things that I don't implement and that I can't do like on my computer. The reason I wrote this is someone had asked me for an article. They were like, hey, do you want to write an article for us about something? And I was like, oh, yeah, I read this cool paper. I want to write this article. But then I was like, well, to write the article, I need to implement it, right? Because like, what good is it if you don't implement it on your computer? And then there was the question of like, wait, can I implement this? Is it going to be super hard? Well, at first I was like, wait, like, how do I get a neural network model, right? And like, do I need to train it? Because I only had my laptop, which is from 2013. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I don't have a GPU and I can't train this model, right? Like, it's not going to happen. And the first cool thing I learned is that actually you don't need to train models all the time. You can download them. So I found a version of ImageNet which I could download, which is the same model from the paper. And I just downloaded it and it was like 100 megabytes. And I was like, sweet, great. (laughs) Because I just needed to trick the model, right? I didn't need to train it. So it was good enough to download it. And what's the tricking procedure like? I think it's useful to talk about the basic idea. So let's talk about logistic regression first instead. So let's say you have this really big vector, has 1000 entries in it or something. I think the way the paper explains it is that like, well, the L1 norm is really different from the L infinity norm. And you're like, what does that mean? Right? Like... (laughs) Like, like I had to think through like why that was relevant at all. But what I was trying to say is let's say you have some vector like an image, which is a vector of like RGB values. And let's say you make a really small change to that vector. Like you add like a, a value of like 0.1 to it. So 0.1 is not that big of a number. And if you're just like changing an image, that's not going to result in like a visually obvious change to your image, right? But if you instead take the sum of all those like 0.1 values and there's like a thousand things in the vector, then that's going to add up to uh, 100, right? Which is a really big number. You can kind of exploit this by saying, okay, let's say I have some logistic regression model, which is just a vector that where I'm taking like the dot product of my image with this other vector. If you add some like small error and you make the signs of those errors match up with your vector that you're taking the dot product of, then you can make it the result of your, of like taking the dot product of the logistic function, the vector and your vector change a lot. Does that make sense? It's hard to say it without like a whiteboard. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we'll make an analogy, if you'll humor me, to steganography, where you can embed a hidden piece of data in an image in a subtle way people can't see. Is there a parallel there? So I guess you're sort of like superimposing on your image a very light thing, which matches up exactly, which is kind of, I guess, like in phase with whatever the model is. So that when you take the dot product, some like large positive number gets added to the output. And actually, when I did this in practice, like the steganography thing is interesting because when I did this with the paper towel, I don't know if this is meaningful, but when I like made this like vector to trick it with the paper towel, I got a bunch of swirls. Like the pattern it looked like was some swirls. And I was like, oh, maybe that's because paper towels have swirls. But maybe it's not. I don't know. (laughs) But like it seemed like there was sort of like some meaning, you know, to like the very light vector I was adding and that it actually was related to like the paper towel. 
Yeah, that was one aspect I really enjoyed about your blog post. Maybe you could go a little deeper about some of the ways you just sort of raw interacted with the model. For example, I myself had never thought to ask, what is a perfectly black square or get classified as? <laughs> what did you learn just kind of uh, having a conversation with the model, if you will? Totally. I always like to do ridiculous things with computers when I'm trying to understand them, I guess, because I feel like you often learn a lot more that way, right? To be like, okay, instead of let's try to classify something normal, let's classify like a black square. So let me see. I'm just going to look to see what the blog post said. Ah, yeah. So it said that the black square was like 27.38% velvet and 4.67% of paper towel. Well, the paper towel is weird, but the 20% velvet, I almost want to say that's an A minus, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. It could be black velvet and poor lighting or something. Another funny thing actually in there was I looked at the queen. This particular model doesn't know anything about people at all. And it said it was... To be clear, Queen Latifah, what queen are we talking about? Oh, sorry, the queen of England. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that queen. So I asked it about a picture of the Queen of England and it was like, oh, that's definitely a shower cap. 99.7% because of the crowd. <laughs> and I guess maybe all of their pictures of shower caps are worn by old women. Like, I don't know, right? Like, it's hard to know why it thought that exactly. But it was very sure that, that the Queen of England was a shower cap. Like, you know, your training set is your training set, I guess. That raises an interesting point. I mean, a lot of these examples, probably seen the one of like, is it a dog or is it a chocolate chip muffin? And there's a lot of these cases that are sort of benign and almost juvenile and like mistakes we can laugh at. I don't as often see mistakes of like, of concern, like, oh, it's labeled someone as a criminal when it's just a person walking down the street. Did you see anything like of concern or were they mostly like silly mistakes when you were able to trick the machine at the lowest levels? Well, I could trick the machine into thinking anything I wanted. So so I could say like, oh, here's the queen. And then I could, I didn't test this specifically, but I think that I could probably trick it into thinking that the queen was a vulture, right? Like I could take like any label and convince it that any image was that label. It's kind of interesting in that some of these mistakes seem almost explainable to us. Like, oh, we see what you were going for. But then there's this added layer. We can start to manipulate the images and get it to say just about anything like you were pointing out. But that is a distortion. In any of those cases, were you able to tell like, oh, I can see this image has been manipulated? No, because the pixel values I was adding were very small. So you can tell at all that it was manipulated. No. Gotcha. So it's really below the threshold, I guess, in that respect. And then how dramatic could it be? It wouldn't surprise me if you know you could get a car to be a truck or something like that. But uh, in terms of crossing these class boundaries, to what extent can you trick the machine? Thanks to this week's sponsor, Terminus DB. Terminus DB is a model-driven graph database. It's open source now and forever, and it's been battle tested in a number of industrial settings. Yet surprisingly, it's open source, and you can try it out for free. Terminus DB can unlock the access of graph databases to your project or application, store data in its ideal form so the data scientists can make better use of it. The best way to sum it up is to say that Terminus DB is like Git, but for data. Can you imagine having source code that you don't manage with Git? Well, how are you managing your data? If you don't have a quick answer, head over to TerminusDB.com and see if it might be the solution for you. So the first thing I did was I took this like black screen and I made it like 100% paper towel. This is definitely a paper towel with probability like 99.9% .9 or something. And then I had a panda and I made that into 100% a vulture because I think I found that the panda wasn't a vulture at all. I don't think I found things that I couldn't do. Like a panda doesn't look like a vulture and it's definitely not like 99.9% .9 a vulture, right? Like the differences are pretty big. The paper towel is pretty interesting. What, as you kind of went down the gradient and accented the most paper towelist of the paper towel features, I don't know, what, what is the extreme example of a paper towel look like? It, it looks really swirly. If you multiply the pixels, it just looks black. But then if you like amplify the pixels, you see a bunch of swirls that are all kinds of different weird colors. You show a number of those examples where there's this, I don't know if we call it the mask or the composite, but the distortion that gets applied. I find myself at points sort of reading into those and thinking like, oh, it must be the swirl that's kind of the design that the popular brands use, or it must be these features of a panda's face. To what degree do you think that sort of anthropomorphizing is appropriate? Yeah, it's not clear. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I wouldn't say. I would not say 100%. <laughs> it could definitely just be made up. But something's going on. Maybe we could comment on how diffuse it is. Do the distortions tend to gather in regions? How do they compare amongst each other? 
I can tell you something different that's interesting, actually, which is, so there are two ways you can do this tricking thing. So when you take this neural network and you're trying to trick it, you can either try to move it towards something like, oh, I would like to make this more like a paper towel, or you could be like, I can make this less like a cat and you can move it away. Basically, just like whether you put a plus sign or a minus sign on your vector of like 0.1s. So one thing that I tried was I would take dogs and it would be like, oh, this is a corgi or whatever. And then I would be like, okay, let's make it less like a corgi. What if it's not that? And then it would pick like a different type of dog instead. And then I'd be like, okay, but also not that dog. And I would sort of like keep on moving it away from whatever species of dog it had picked. And it would keep on picking different dogs, which seemed to make sense. To what degree do you imagine that might be a bias of the ImageNet data set? That there are a lot of dogs or... I guess so. Like, I mean, that it could make a sort of child's mistake looking at a picture of the queen, but it's like you're struggling to convince it that a dog is not a dog. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My sense was definitely that there were a lot of dogs in that data set because it was somewhat difficult to move it away from the idea that something was a dog. And then I'd love to know more about that process. It makes sense to me intuitively that you distort it. No, it's not a corgi. It's this type of dog. Were you in kind of uh, what I guess an optimization person might call a deep valley? Or were you at some point able to pop out of that and make the dog? into some non-dog thing. So I don't remember if I could get the dog to a different thing. I do have this graph of what happened when I moved the panda into being a vulture. At first, I tried to go in just like one step, add one vector that was going to trick it into being a vulture. And that actually didn't work. That was, I think, what the paper said to do. And it worked sometimes, but sometimes it didn't. So what I ended up doing actually was taking sort of like 100 small steps towards being a vulture. So I would take like the gradient of the neural network, take a small step sort of in the direction of vulture, like see where I got and then take another small step from there. And it turned out that sort of like taking 100 small steps to try to make it a vulture worked a lot better. But on its way to becoming a vulture, it also went through like Madagascar cat and gibbon for some reason. But there is definitely like a rise. It first sort of went towards like Madagascar cat and more than vulture. And then the vulture later on took over. I feel like that must mean something about the like space of images. And actually, oh, I think at some point also it went through being an ostrich on the way to vulture. And I asked a machine learning expert about this question. And I was like, oh, it was like a panda. And then it went to being an ostrich to being a vulture. He was like, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. There's this panda ostrich situation. I was like, really? Maybe it's because they have a lot of black on them. Like, I don't know. But I was so surprised because I thought this was just like a random thing that just happened. But he was like, no, this is a real thing in the data that happens with neural networks. You know, it's funny you should mention that because that example perked my ears that you went through Gibbon. There's the famous paper, maybe you know it as well, one of the earlier Fooling Images ones. And their example is, here's a panda, apply the filter, get a Gibbon. Yeah, there must be something about that Gibbon that in the multidimensional space, they're in a close manifold or whatever. I, I don't know how to describe it, but there's something there for sure. Oh man, I'm now looking at pictures of pandas and gibbons on my phone and trying to understand. I guess they both have black around their eyes. Maybe that's it. Yeah, that's an interesting aspect of this. How can we know what it's doing? The systems do seem to, by and large, do a nice job, but also make these mistakes. Do you think that the way in which we trick them gives us any hints about the quality of the models? I find it hard to comment on this kind of stuff because honestly, I still don't know a lot about neural networks. So I don't like to give like big takes about what this means. I think it definitely made me feel like it was not super magical if it was so easy to trick. Well, it made me think it was kind of linear, I guess, is the point. As like a math person, my overall impression was just like, oh, this is more linear than I thought. And I don't know what it means that a neural network is like, quote unquote, like more linear than I thought. But I think it's really interesting. Well, as you point out in the blog post, there are many amazing things that come out of this technology. You can now do image search and get exactly the child you're looking for, whatever the case may be. Great at retrieving cute pictures, for sure. Possibly great at driving cars. I don't know yet. Given your experience and the knowledge of neural networks, the degree to which you have, how do you feel? Where are the lines? You know, what are you comfortable relying on a neural network for? I think with machine learning in general, it's really important to understand that the importance of your training set, what we saw with like the queen and the shower cap. If something isn't in your training set, it's not going to be in your model. I feel like that's the most common thing that sort of like lay people don't understand about machine learning. How common it is to have training sets that in some way don't reflect real world world data and how it means that then the model isn't going to work on that real world data that like isn't represented in the training set, you know. So I read a lot of literature on different ways we can fool these types of systems. And we interview a lot of people who are trying to develop these automated processes. But all the wonderful academic side aside, there's this aspect of this where 
you know, you went through n- some non-trivial steps, but you downloaded something, wrote some code, and were able to interact with this thing. And without it having been to NIPS and read every single of the latest papers, you're able to be like, look, the queen is not wearing a shower cap. I was just curious if I could get some of your general thoughts on how, I don't know if it's hacker ethic or just ingenuity that you bring to the table. How might people who don't have PhDs in machine learning attack and learn things about the models? Well, I definitely don't have a PhD in machine learning. I took one machine learning class in my master's. That was it. And I think this whole project took me maybe three days, something like that. It definitely took a lot of hours in those three days, maybe. You know, it wasn't like a huge project. I mean, the iPython notebook or the, the Jupyter notebook is amazing. Basically, all I did was I downloaded this model and I, I used Cafe. I guess that was what I found. But I'm sure it would have worked with TensorFlow too if I could get that to work. Oh, yeah. It says it only took six hours of cursing, which was pretty good. It's one of my favorite lines in the post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I made a GitHub repo, which has all of this. Though it probably doesn't work anymore because it was four years ago. Yeah, I think it's pretty approachable, especially if you're not trying to train the model. I think that playing with the model and trying to see how it behaves is a lot easier than trying to train the model where you need to figure out like, parameters and it takes so long to train it and like what's going on. And I feel like if you really want to get hands-on with the model it's more fun to sort of play with it and i think the other thing that i didn't realize actually is that you can interact with them at a different level than just putting predictions into it right because i had the model i could take like the derivative of the model at the point and that it's really easy to do that because at first i spent like probably like six hours trying to figure out how to take a derivative and then eventually i was like oh back propagation is literally taking the derivative and it's like the most common function the thing that neural networks want to do the most is to give you derivatives uh, which is the thing that the paper was about about. You can sort of like do that and explore. The models are a little plastic, I guess, right? Yeah. You know, I had spent some time and gave up trying to figure out the right question I could ask you that solicited that exact comment from the blog post. I really like when you said, oh, this is basically just the chain rule. It's the most delightfully dismissive yet accurate description of deep learning I've heard. <laughs> yeah, right. I think I asked on Twitter, like someone who I knew, it was like, Julia, it's just the chain rule. That's what backprop is. And I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, well, good. Like now I know where I am, right? Like now I'm oriented. And highlights the fact that, yes, these are very linear systems that we're able to manipulate them because the derivatives give them away in certain respects. I guess, as we said, you have some ML background. Maybe you don't do a lot of this heavy-duty deep learning every minute of the day. But do you have any general thoughts on what it would take in terms of design to come up with models that don't suffer from these sorts of challenges? Do we need a revolution or is this just going to be incremental? Oh, man. I mean, I've never seen a model that doesn't suffer from these sorts of challenges. Yeah, me either. But I think we give ourselves credit that we don't. I mean, yes, we get fooled by optical illusions, but whatever algorithm I'm running seems to not have this property. I don't think that's true. Oh, yeah? (laughs) My impression, I guess, of machine learning models in general is that, like, if you give it something weird, it's not going to work. Like, if you give it something which is, like, well represented in its training set, then that's great. I think it's pretty common in the real world to have machine learning models because like most machine learning models exist in the real world, you know, and so they're getting all kinds of weird data thrown at them all the time. And so, of course, it's going to do something dumb and sometimes harmful. I would go more towards we should put some safeguards on those systems and make sure that like nothing super bad can happen when the model does something dumb than to figure out how we can trust the machine learning model completely. That's good advice. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was a little bit along the lines of the toolbox. You certainly have a strong proficiency in a lot of the things people would need to pull this stuff together and can do a project like this. What are some of the key things you think an aspiring data scientist needs to know to walk a similar path? Yeah, obviously Python is amazing. The Jupyter Notebook is amazing because it lets you do this kind of exploration where instead of writing a program, you're just like, oh, what happens if I do this? Oh, what about that? Oh, what about that? And I think it's a much more fun way to work. In this post, I think this is actually where I first learned about Docker because I needed to install this whole like cafe thing and it was super confusing. And so I'm pretty sure I downloaded a Docker container, which had kind of everything installed inside it already. And that was super useful because it just made the installation burden a lot less. And I'm not sure if I was going to be able to install it on my laptop otherwise without having that container. And I guess there's also just the willingness to use some new framework that you don't understand, right? Like, I didn't understand Cafe. I still don't understand Cafe. But, like, I kind of managed to, like, wrangle it to do what I wanted, like, in this case. And I was like, all right, I just need to take one derivative. That's literally the only function I need from this. And so I just learned how to do that. And I don't understand anything else about Cafe. I I got what I wanted. 
Absolutely. So to wind up, let's uh, remind everybody the paper that inspired your work in case they want to read that after they've gone through your blog post and get a little deeper. What's the paper that got you started along this path? It's called Explaining and Harnessing Adversarial Examples from 2015, and it's 11 pages. I found it pretty clear. I'd really recommend reading it. And the other thing that I read that helped you with this, also from 2015, is called Breaking Linear Classifiers on ImageNet by Andre Karpathy. It also talks about pandas and gibbons. It explains how to trick it into thinking a panda is a given. <laughs> yeah, and we found that those two things independently. <laughs> so I think there's really something about the pandas and the givens. <laughs> but yeah, that post has a lot of really great pictures. For sure, yeah, I'll have links to all that in the show notes, as well as places people can learn more about your zines. Julie, where else can people follow you online? I'm on Twitter at Bork. I have a blog. That's it. And I believe it's Bork is B0RK? <laughs> it's B0RK, that's right. Cool. And I'll have that link in the show notes as well. Thanks for taking the time to come on. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic Interpretability. Our guest this week was Julia Evans. Our theme song is Number 5 by Big D and the Kids Table. Claudia Armbruster is our associate producer. Vanessa Bersiaga does guest coordination. I've been your host, Kyle Polich. Stay in and stay safe, everybody.